Hello, and welcome to another episode of the B2B Leadership Podcast. My name is Nils Vinya, and today my guest is Don Farhi. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you. <clears throat> Great to be here. Yeah, excited to talk with all things leadership with you, Don. But first, let's give the audience a little bit of background, who you are and where you're working today. What kind of role are you in and what company are you working for? Yeah, great. So uh, right now I am the VP of Customer Experience at Simpler. I've been here for just over four years. We're a, um, we're a startup and uh, we promote um, employee engagement and employee, employee communication at its core. So uh, we've seen a lot of changes over the last few years, and it's been a really fun, fun growth area. <laughs> That's fantastic. Employee engagement. Um, can you give us a, maybe just a little example of what that even means in the simpler world? What is it that yeah, you so, guys are trying to do? Yeah, so the, the issue that we're really generally trying to solve is we know that um, organizations of all sizes um, struggle with really getting all their um, employees aligned on the messaging, on their miss missions, making sure that employees have all the right and same information and access to um, critical information to do their jobs um, and to just build the culture uh, uh, collectively, uh, especially if they're a distributed organization. So uh, we help our customers build their intranets and make it a, uh, a digital platform uh, for them to really help build their digital culture, um, you know, try to emulate what they've kind of built in some of their brick and mortar um, buildings, but um, especially under COVID and as organizations continue to grow um, in different parts of the world, uh, keeping all of their employees aligned. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Now, the concept of the intranet has been around for a long time. And I know there's been various iterations and probably even generations of it too. So how do you view intranets like, today as opposed to what they used to be and, and what are you doing that's fundamentally different that you guys are bringing to the table? Yeah. So uh, historically, intranets have been kind of just a, a, a place to store information. It's kind yeah. of just been a, um, a primary uh, document sharing or document placement or, um, uh, location. So maybe it's where you're going to go to look for your benefits or to see what your expense policy is, uh, are. Um, and what we're really looking to do is uh, solve that because that still needs to, or still accommodate that, but really allow for a two-way uh, conversation between employees and the rest of the organization. And so, first of all, um, to answer your question about, you know, how is it different today than it was, because um, you're right, it's, it's not new. Um, the concept isn't new, but uh, before it was not a great interface. It wasn't very mm -hmm. user friendly. It was very text heavy. Um, it wasn't very easy to navigate. It wasn't very easy to get information on there. Um, and so now we're making it easy for um, the content folks that need to publish information or want to get their messaging out to the organization, making it easy for them, easy for the end users, the employees to consume it, um, and just make sure that it's a really enjoyable experience. So the difference is really kind of just a modern experience, um, but also solving the document access issue and yeah. the knowledge access issue, but then also taking advantage of having employees um, engaged in a in a platform so that um, leaders can understand, um, you know, maybe where uh, other questions need to be answered from employees and what other content should be created to to help them uh, do their jobs. Love it. And when, when things, even though the concept's been around for a while, there's always an opportunity to evolve. And I love that you guys are doing that. I've had my share of experiences with intranets. With None of them terribly <laughs> memorable. I think we all say. have, yeah. Right? Everybody <laughs> has? Yeah. So that's really cool. So, Don, that's fantastic. And we've all had some challenging issues with uh, intranets. Some of many of my experiences have not exactly been that memorable. Mm -hmm. So wonderful to hear that you guys are providing a modern version of that. And I want to come back to more about what you're doing in the C VP of CX at Simpler. But let's go back in time and let's take a look at, you know, where you were when you got into your first leadership position, the first time you were really responsible for people. Set the stage for us. What was going on? Yeah, so I had been hired as a key account manager, which, of you know, kind of is what we now know as customer success manager. But at the time, um, and our team was growing, um, I was at a division of Citrix Systems called Citrix Online. And um, it was cutting edge technology at the time to have um, online uh, meetings and webinars and that sort of thing. And the team was growing. And as a result, we needed to um, have more leadership. And I was really fortunate that um, that both my boss and, and my leader and, um, and the VP were 
were willing and able to uh, kind of grow the leadership team um, from within as opposed to kind of bringing someone from the outside. Um, and so I did have to go through like a formal interview process and really talk through like, you know, what my leadership style would be and how I would handle different um, scenarios. So it wasn't, it definitely wasn't a given, yeah. um, but that's how it, that's how it evolved. And it was great that I had that opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, that's a fantastic opportunity. And you had the support of your boss and, and VP. So I'm curious, you know, there was a number of people on this team. And what was it that you did or did not do that set you up to be in a position to actually interview for that role? Because not everybody, you know, probably went in name went into the hat. So what did you do in order to put yourself into that position where you were going to be one of the candidates for that leadership role? Yeah, I think in general um, and look, looking back, um, so I had been there maybe about a year or so and you know, I think a lot of times when we look at leadership, we always assume it's kind of, you know, managing people and it's, um, you know, like that's kind of the the holy grail of, of leadership, so to speak. Um, but a lot of it just has to do with leadership in terms of um, how you're helping the other team members, how you're mm -hmm. leading different projects, um, how you're bridging gaps between, um, you know, your team and maybe other functions. And so um, I had a few opportunities to really promote just in general some leadership skills, even if they weren't directly with people. And so, um, you know, one of the things that my that that boss that um, that I was talking about, um, one of her mantras was always, you know, be a known entity, um, mm -hmm. especially at the time. Um, most of our team was remote. Um, we were based in Santa Barbara, but our most of us were not located in Santa Barbara. And so but that's where headquarters was. So, you know, really making sure that people kind of know who you are and what contributions you're making and what problems you're helping solve, et cetera, um, is really important. So you have to kind of really be proactive to to get your name there. So I think um, I, I, you know, was very cognizant of that. And I think that's one of the things that kind of really helped me um, kind of make that path there. Wow, that's that's fantastic. And, and that has been a common theme among some of the other guests on this podcast mm -hmm. is putting yourself in the best possible position to be considered for the leadership position yeah, that you want, sure. regardless yeah. of level. Right. This was you were an individual contributor, but there were many opportunities that you identified, that you seized. And then I love the saying that your boss said that you have to be a known entity. Known entity, yeah. That's perfect. What a great <laughs> piece of happen. advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Even if you're in the VP level, you still have to be a known entity, right? Yeah. Yeah. As much as we would love to think that everybody else knows what we do and understands what we do and understands the value that we provide and our teams provide, reality is everybody else is focused on their own world. So yeah. it's up to you to become the known entity. I love that. Right. Saying. Yeah. Well, especially just as so many, um, I mean, well, especially with COVID, but even prior to COVID, you know, there were just more options of working from home or, yeah. um, or smaller offices, right. And in, in terms of uh, a lot of tech companies, especially like opening hubs in these other cities. Um, but they're still kind of like a headquarters where a lot of the action and, or all yeah. the action is kind of happening. And so um, it, it is really important. And it's a, um, as much as we want to make sure as leaders also that we're giving everybody the, the right opportunities, um, just sometimes you just really need FaceTime and um, and just getting more involved with people that you wouldn't ordinarily have access to if you're just kind of sitting in your in your home office. So that's it brings up. OK, so I want to drill in on something as for your advice. Right. Let's say there's somebody out there listening who is like, wow, be a known entity. That sounds that sounds great. I get it. <laughs> How do, How do I, do I actually it? do that without like bragging or coming off as like showing off myself or being all about me? Because especially in the world of customer success, it's a little hard sometimes to put yourself first and say, these are all the things that I'm doing when that actually is exactly what you need to do. So what advice would yeah. you have for somebody who identifies with the concept of being a known, becoming a known entity? However, they might be a little uncertain about how to actually go about doing that. Yeah. Um, let me think about that for a second, because I, I can kind of actually draw on a couple other scenarios, even like really early in my career when I was at um, Hewitt Associates, which mm -hmm. is um, it was a um, consulting firm based in Chicago. And we were billable. That was, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it was a billable role. And I think that's probably where I kind of like really learned how to do that, because um, to really kind of grow and be successful there, you um, and, and a lot of consulting companies, you really want to work on awesome projects yep. and you want to have high billable rates and you want to be involved with senior consultants. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, part of what you kind of do there is just try to get on projects that will give you more exposure and 
um, you know, and give you more experience and, um, uh, you know, um, exposure to new skills that you would need to build. And so that's probably where I built a little bit of that Mm. just kind of rhythm, um, because it's even as a junior consultant, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're billable. And so you really had to go and kind of introduce yourself to other um, to other consultants that are kind of more senior that want to bring you on a project. And so um, at the time, that was a little easier because we were all in the office and everything. But at its core, it's introducing yourself to people and kind of not being shy to do that. Um, it's really important that you're at a culture that is open to that, right? Like that you can just kind of get on someone's calendar and say, hey, I just want to chat through things for 15 minutes or something. So it can be as basic as that. But I think in terms of like actually executing it is finding projects Mm -hmm. Um, to get involved in. And it might be leading a project. It might even just be helping somebody out on a project. Um, And so really keeping an eye open for those and um, and not waiting for your boss to be the one to identify it, but identifying them yourselves. So either identifying ones that you can get involved with or kind of creating something that would then, you know, provide value for other teams. So that's kind of a, in terms of like executing, that's that's one of the best ways to do it, I think. Perfect advice. I love it. Anybody can put that into action. Again, at any level, right? This is appropriate, yeah. whether yeah. it's first time manager, director, VP, C level even. We all have to be a known entity. And I really like the call out that you mentioned of not waiting for your boss or somebody else to tell you to work on a project or to hand a project to you, right? To identify those opportunities and to put yourself in a position to either contribute to those projects or create a project in and of yourself. So did your boss ever come to you and say, Don, here's a wonderful strategic project that I'd love for you to lead? (laughs) Or Um, was it more of a matter of you identified these things where there were problems and you came up and said, I can solve this or I can contribute to the solution? Yeah, I mean, it was was probably a little of of both, but I think it was mostly the latter. It was mostly, you know, me um, kind of seeing opportunities and, you know, and, and maybe it was maybe one was kind of influencing the other, right? Like it was kind of talking through what problems kind of needed to be solved. And then it was like, okay, hey, you might be the good person to kind of lead something like this. Yeah. Um, I think a, 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 a you, you kind of touched on, you know, not waiting for your boss and everything. And that's that's a key part that um, I actually, to be honest, almost wish I would have actually learned earlier in my career. Mm. Um, but you really have to own your own career. I think I've been very lucky that I did have um, a couple of leaders early on that kind of took me under their wing a little bit for that. But yeah. um, but I think really understanding that you drive your career, you drive the things that you're going to be involved with. Um, and if you take that ownership then and kind of realize that early, um, you'll probably go a little bit, you'll, you'll get involved in more things. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think the other thing too is, I know there's kind of a leadership mantra of, you know, don't bring me problems, only bring me solutions. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't really personally like that. I don't subscribe to it as an employee or as a, um, as a leader. Cause I think it's very, I think it can really stifle people's, um, ability or, um, wanting to sh- kind of share problems because you don't always have the answer right away. Sometimes right. you need to actually talk through the problem to then figure out, um, what the solution is. So I think, uh, maybe not just coming just with problems, but at least coming with ideas then, right? It yeah. doesn't have to be the full solution. But mm-hmm. um, if you have an idea, kind of going back to the being the known entity and, you know, kind of creating a project or an initiative or something, um, identifying at least, hey, this is kind of where I think a problem. I don't really know exactly how to solve it, but here's some ideas that I have. Yeah. Um, we'll at least still get, get um, you know, leaders' attention and uh, hopefully get you some momentum there. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on the sentiment of the cliched, you know, don't bring me problems only, bring me solutions. It assumes yeah. a little bit too much, right? Yeah, that, I agree. That <laughs> everything can be solved without any involvement from... Discussion or collaboration, yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. just not true, right? So, <laughs> so, but the ideas, what you just said there, what the ideas to bring to the table, right? This is, that can be a complete figment of your imagination, right? And sometimes I think um, as leaders, we can get locked into what we see right in front of us. And we have to take a step outside of that to look at, okay, what are all the possibilities of how I might be able to solve this problem or how we as a team or we as a company might be able to solve this problem, even if they're harebrained like crazy stuff. 
Right? Yeah, Sometimes yeah. it takes that to evolve and get to the other side so that you can come to the table and say, here's what I've considered. I think this one might be the right path, but this is what I'd like to have a discussion on. As a yeah. leader myself, I would love it if somebody came to me with that level of um, preparation and that level of thought. I would respect them tremendously yeah. right? and then yeah. engage me to help them get the last 10 percent that they needed that they just couldn't get on their own. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so as you progressed in when you took over that team of key account managers and progressed there at Citrix and additional through additional roles and other companies, what were some of the key leadership themes and, and core philosophies that you developed that really enabled you to be successful as you continued to rise up through the ranks, eventually getting to VP level? Yeah, I think um, one thing that um so I talked about the known entity. Um, yep. Another piece of advice that there were two things that um, I remember uh, my VP, Elizabeth, um, kind of was kind of during the interview process, so to speak. Um, there were two pieces of advice that she shared that I, I can't say that I've completely lived by, but I've always been conscious of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I try to try to live by it. She said, uh, first of all, don't be afraid to hire people that are better and smarter than you. Mm. Um, and that's really, really important as a leader. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to think, oh, if I bring on people to my team that are better in certain things that, you know, you feel like it's identifying your own weakness or it's identifying a vulnerability or um, or somehow it's going to reflect poorly on you that, you know, you didn't know this. But that's exactly what you need to do as a leader is identify where are there gaps on the team. And it might even be your own skill set and how do you uh, create that um, that that more broad um, coverage on your team. Um, because they're the ones that can help you, you know, still uh, fulfill whatever objectives and goals you have. So that's really important. And it's it's something that you it's, it's kind of an internal bias. So you do kind of have to be very conscious about thinking through, you know, what when you're interviewing and what you're truly trying to trying to accomplish there. Um, another area was uh, we were talking through, like, how do you coach people through performance issues? Mm. And, you know, those those kind of managing people can be really, um, you know, it, it can be a lot, uh, it can be a big part of what your job is. Um, and, you know, people have problems, right? They have personal problems, they have professional problems, um, there's a lot going on in their lives. And as a leader, you really want to take into consideration like their whole world, mm -hmm. not just their work world, so that you can really help them be the best, you know, kind of best version of themselves. So um, at work, at least. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that I remember us talking through was, you know, how do you when you see potential in somebody, but they're not operating at that level um, or if you have to formally address somebody's lack of performance, like how do you do that effectively and um, make sure that they're in the, the right role for them? So um, those were those are some pretty uh, like, you know, they're kind of two ends of the spectrum. Um, but as a kind of people leader and um, and just as a as a business leader, those are, are two kind of critical things that I've really tried to keep in mind. Yeah, those are wonderful. Hiring better and smarter, identifying your own gaps on your team and then filling yeah. them and understanding somebody's whole world. And that, you know, both of those are critically important. And I think both of them have varying degrees of application, again, regardless of level that you're at. First time yeah. manager, director, VP, C level. Right. There can always be a hesitation on hiring somebody better and smarter than you. Then the natural question is, wait, what am I going to do? Right, <laughs> they, right. Or all of a sudden, somebody's going to look at the person I hired and say, well, why don't you do your job? Yeah, exactly. They can just so, do it better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And then it's a good motivator <laughs> internally, right? <clears throat> but it also means that there are always going to be, well, there are always going to be bigger and more valuable problems to solve that you might be able to solve that if someone better than you can take over your job, then that's wonderful, right? right that's right. a huge win for them. It's a huge win for you. It's a huge win for the organization. And there's really no real downside aside from our ego. I think that's right, what right. gets, would you say that, that that's what gets in the way of yeah, that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ego and, and then also job security, right? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, you want to make sure that um, you don't want to be hiring yourself out of a job is probably what, what some people kind of think through. But if you're at an organization that is um, supporting growth, not just for the people that you're hiring, but also for yourself, yeah. um, you know, take advantage of the people on your team that, that can do those things better so that it opens up then opportunity for you to focus on other um, you know, other things that maybe you haven't been able to. So, 
Um, yeah, that's that's right. And that that you know, that all starts in the mindset, right? If you're inside of an environment, obviously it does require the environment of growth or environment yeah. of development, a focus of the organization on wanting to foster growth and development for its employees, not just, you know, mandate this is all you do and that's it, right? I don't think that happens too much anymore, but it certainly is out there. Yeah. Um, so how do you go about fostering that inside of your team at Simpler? And is this something that's perfectly aligned with a company's philosophy and kind of structure? Is this something that you fostered within your organization? We'd love to hear your thoughts on how this plays out for you today. In, in terms of um, the, the growth, hiring of the growth piece. Yeah, the growth piece and just, you know, fostering the development and reinforcing how important it is for the members of the team to continue to improve and to continue to progress, even if that means potentially bringing somebody on the team who is better than they are. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so for context of where Simpler is, we're a startup. And so the team's grown uh, pretty rapidly over the last year. And, um, and so there's been opportunities for folks to move into formal leadership roles, like in terms of actual management as our team's grown and, you know, we need uh, more of that leadership coverage. Um, but there's even more opportunities just to, to kind of lead through projects and initiatives. And so in terms of the growth piece, um, you know, it's, it's, it's understanding what, um, what team members are ultimately trying to accomplish if they're trying to grow their career um, in terms of kind of title and that sort of thing, um, you know, kind of seeing where that fits within the organization. Um, but if, if and, and there's don't always align, right? Like, you know, people might want to move into a certain position and that's just not where the business needs um, a role right now. But then it's looking at, okay, well, where are the other areas for growth and where we are as an organization? And this is where we're really trying to um, have people build their leadership skills and hopefully develop is just how can you make an impact with other um, other areas in terms of projects, um, making sure that we're getting more efficient. Um, you know, if we know that there's gaps in certain things that we can or should be doing for customers, you know, how can they contribute to that? So um, really, uh, it's it's trying to foster the environment so that people feel that it's comfortable and um, okay to take certain risks um, and having a true, I don't want to say open door policy, but making sure that, you know, all the leaders on the team are um, open to hearing different ideas so that, you know, it gives those individuals um, that aren't formally in a manager position, but mm -hmm. an opportunity to to still uh, work cross-functionally or work within the team or um, be able to promote some of the, their ideas. <clears throat> yeah, that I mean, that's really key. And I love that you're fostering that kind of environment because that's that's how you understand the whole person. Right. That's how you yeah. begin to understand what makes them tick. What are their strengths? What do what do they want to focus the on in their down, career yeah. down the line? Yeah. And and one thing um, that I've also kind of evolved partially, probably with my own experience. But, um, you know, even even folks that are, uh, you know, all in with their jobs, you know, their maybe I don't want to say dedication, but their like involvement or their mental capacity kind of it might go in ebbs and flows over different phases of their life. Right. And, um, you know, an obvious one being when, you know, sometimes when people have children and or certain mm -hmm. stages of, of having kids, right. Like just sometimes you can't um, maybe work as many hours or have as much mental capacity to give to work. Right. And so you're still in a player, you're still very well regarded um, or whatever. But, and I think as a, as a leader kind of understanding where somebody is in that phase of life is really important because they still have a lot of potential and you kind of want to be there to support them and recognize that, Hey, they might not, you know, maybe they used to give 110%, but maybe this phase of their life, they're only going to be able to give, you know, 95 or a hundred or whatever. Um, but it's, it's recognizing kind of where they are so that you can maximize um, their experience and, and their kind of productivity um, knowing that it might, you know, might come back to kind of where it was or it might not. And that's OK, too. And just kind of recalibrating then kind of what your expectations are with them. <clears throat> yeah, that's I mean, that sounds like a wonderful environment where that's respected. It's it's OK to air that. It's OK to to share that you might not be able to do everything perfectly forever, okay. even in a fast yeah. growing startup. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, and and it, and it comes back to that, your point on, on understanding where somebody is that, you know, we have the ability as leaders to either to impact someone else's life, period, right? Guaranteed, yeah. if you're in a people leadership position, even if you're not, you have the ability to impact someone else's life. Now, whether you do that in a positive way or a negative way is 100% up to you. Up to you, yeah, yeah. Right? 
And that's the one thing I've been the recipient of, unfortunately, the negative thing for many years in the early parts of my career, which drove me so far on the other side to become, you know, focused on leadership and development and sharing tools and coaching and helping other people avoid this at all costs. Right. <laughs> because what comes out the other side is just an, an, a much better world when people have tools and they have confidence and they have an environment like you've built where it's OK to not be, you know, the star every single day, every single time, just given yeah. that life's going to change. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think to kind of tie it back to kind of being the known entity, this is where the reality is it's kind of important to establish that first so that when you do kind of, if, if you do need to kind of step back or something that people still know kind of, um, kind of know how, you, how you're contributing and the value that you, that you do still provide. Um, it's, a, it's a little harder to kind of maybe back away in those types of scenarios yeah. um, if, if, if it hasn't, if that kind of hasn't been established and you haven't built the credibility and or the trust, um, you know, with, with your peers or, or other leaders within the organization. That's so a, um, there's kind of an order of operation there. Yeah. <laughs> no, it totally does. And, and it's almost like, you know, setting, you're setting expectations, right? You're setting expectations yeah. for what your contribution level is, what your commitment level is, what your capabilities are. And then sometimes, you're going to not be able to meet those expectations. But if you've set them and people know that it's possible, then when you deliberately say, I got to take a little step back, it's okay. As yeah. opposed to not setting them and then saying, I got to take a step back. And everybody's like, wait, what do you mean? I, I don't yeah, understand. Right. Like you step are, back. You're taking a step back, it seemed like. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. So Don, if you were going to um, sit down and have a conversation with yourself back when you were a first time in the people leadership position as a key account manager, when you got promoted into that position at Citrix and you could, you know, everything, you know, today and all of your experiences, and you could sit down and have a brief conversation with yourself. What advice would you give to yourself? Hmm. So, um, I think one area that I still work on is, um, it's kind of seems cliche, but is delegation. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I, I don't even really like that word because I feel like delegation is very hierarchical. It's kind of like, yeah. you know, you're, you know, you own something and you're passing it down to somebody else. So it's not even, I, I feel like the organization, at, at least kind of in some startups, right, where it's a little bit flatter, right? There aren't as many, um, there aren't as many maybe layers. And so it's not always a delegating kind of like down to an individual, but I think it's really identifying um, and preparing um, what you're trying to accomplish. And then what are the other people that can help you accomplish that? So, but you have to really know what you're trying to accomplish so that you can involve other people. Yeah. And sometimes if you're just kind of going fast and furious and, you know, it's not even the mantra of like, oh, if you just want something done quick, do it yourself. Um, <laughs> because I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I don't subscribe to that, although I might operate like that sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> just because if I, if I need something done, but I haven't given myself the time to um, involve somebody else, I can't ask somebody like, oh, hey, I sat on this for three weeks, but you know, now, now I need it quickly, right? Like you need to involve them early to give them the time. And um, that takes planning and preparation and, you know, kind of identifying, you know, what you're ultimately trying to accomplish. So that's something that I, I still work on, to be honest, um, especially as, you know, as, as my team grows. But something I, I at least have identified as an area um, that I um, want to continue to grow on. And if I would have done that way earlier, I think that would have I think that would have helped. Planning, um, planning and preparation is key, right? That's that's it. And it is uh, the benefit is that it's 100 percent within your control, too. It right? is, yeah, within 100 percent of your control. Exactly. <laughs> I laugh because it, I know it sometimes doesn't seem like it is, but that's the thing. It, it, it that's actually, right. So. It starts with that decision. That it starts it, with that decision. It is yeah. my choice. I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do this. But when we abdicate responsibility to our environment or our culture or our just craziness that it's the end of the quarter and I can't possibly set aside 10 minutes to think about this thing that I've been pushing off for a week or two weeks or two weeks, yeah. it's on us. we got to take responsibility. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> last question. Um, for somebody out there, who is, you know, listen to this, got a lot of great insight and nuggets from you and your experience and just wa and wants to develop their leadership skills, period, across the board, whatever level they're at. What advice would you give them for how to think about doing that and how to go about doing that? So I guess um, I'll answer this maybe in a couple ways. I think um, really trying to establish 
what do you, what, why do you want to become a leader? Yeah. So I remember the, um, I remember one of the, uh, uh, leaders that was kind of helping me prepare for when I was kind of interviewing, um, that she was in a good way. She was like really digging into that. I mean, sometimes you think like, okay, well, that's the way that I get promoted and that's the way I have more earning potential, or that's the way that I, you know, can just grow my career. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has to be more than that. Otherwise you're not going to kind of ultimately succeed. And so there kind of comes a point where you think, Hey, I've been really good at, at, at my role. And now I want to use that and help others accomplish those things um, so that they can grow or that they can help grow the business or improve the business. And so it's really influencing others to mm -hmm. hopefully have the successes that you've had. But I think kind of really at its core, identifying like why you want to kind of get into leadership. Yeah. Um, so in terms of then kind of preparing for it, I think it's, you know, when you kind of get through that, then figure out, you know, okay, what are the skills that you need to do that? If it is people leadership, because that's sometimes um, where there's a little bit of a barrier. Like if you haven't managed people before, like you have to have, you have to be in the very specific, um, there has to be a very specific opportunity where leader, other leaders are, are, you know, kind of taking that risk and or not risk, but chance, right. For a new leader, like somebody did with me. Um, but trying to get some quote unquote people management experience, it might just be mentoring a new person just so that there's some skill that you're developing of interacting with people and helping them accomplish their goals. Um, so it could be through uh, a new employee and you're the one onboarding them and you're the one kind of responsible for, you know, getting them kind of up to speed. It could be a formal mentorship program. Um, we talked about the projects already, but I think the, the people management is a key piece um, to really helping uh, build that skill and um, and help, helping uh, making sure that you're able to illustrate that you have that skill. Yeah, yeah, cool. And I think like while well, you're telling that in the context of someone looking to get into leadership, I think those same questions and some of those same skills, the lens of looking at those could apply even if you've gone down the leadership path. Maybe you're at a director level, maybe you're at manager level, maybe you're at VP level. Yeah. And at some point, we all take a step back and go, whoa, how did I get here? And what yeah. am I really <laughs> doing here? And if you yeah. find yourself in one of those kinds of situations, I guarantee 100% it will come, right? Ask yourself these questions. Why am I in this yeah, leadership Why am I position? here? What do I still want to be doing in this role? And how, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And what are yeah. the, and if, if, if I want to stay in this role or I want to change roles or I want to do that, I think your skills um, angle is perfect. Like what are the skills that are absolutely appropriate? If I, you know, there are some people who might have a tough time with the people management side of things. And if that's a real frustration point, you got to ask yourself the honest question of why am I in this position? Yeah, and yeah. if I really want to be here and I really do agree with this, then what are the skills that I'm lacking right now that I need to get in order to feel more confident in this place? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and there's there's the combination of the the business management and the people management, and yeah. um, that, that can't kind of can't be understated. <laughs> <laughs> agree, agree. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, Don, it's been an absolute blast to spend some time with you today, talking about leadership, your experience. Um, super excited for all of your advice that you shared, and for this audience to put some of these things into action. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today.